have our distinguished chief minister here. And of course, your concerns circular debt ke hawale se has been rightly uh, led over there. May I request the event organizers to set it up because what we'll do after this address is that we will have a conversation, a moderated conversation with the distinguished chief guest as well. So let me take this time while that setup is happening and uh, take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about his illustrious career that spans over 30 years in the public and the private sectors. His key positions included the chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission of Pakistan, chair of committee on power sector audit, circular debt, resolution, and future roadmap, which pr prepared a detailed report for reforming Pakistan's power sector. He was a member of the negotiation team which successfully negotiated revised power tariff and signed the MOUs with the private power producers. Ladies and gentlemen, he's also the founder of some of the leading companies in Pakistan, including Inbox Te Business Technologies, Converge Technologies, Elixir Securities, and Al Shahir Corporation, which is a Meet One, uh, Meet One consumer brand. He's also worked and set up firms in the US, Canada, and UAE, and served on boards of leading Pakistani corporate stock exchange credit rating agency, FBR, um, tax advisory group, and the government of Pakistan's economic coordination committee of the cabinet. He's an MBA from the IBA, University of Karachi, LLM from the University of Toronto, and a mid-career MPA from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Ladies and gentlemen, we are distinguished and we are very delighted to have with us our distinguished chief guest. Please put your hands together for the Minister of Energy, Power and Petroleum, Mr. Muhammad Ali, for his keynote address. Ladies and gentlemen, um, once our distinguished chief guest is done with his keynote address, we'll take this opportunity to invite Mr. Asif Ali Qureshi, who will then be moderating a conversation with him. Sir. Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Uh, it's an honor, it's a privilege to be here, uh, to be invited to the 20th uh, CFA Annual Excellence Awards. Uh, I would like to first thank you, the CFA Society of Pakistan, the President Siljad Anwar, uh, Asif Qureshi and Mohammed Shuaib who were coordinating this event with me at least. And uh, this is for me like uh, homecoming actually. Uh, I was part of this uh, fraternity uh, 30 years ago and uh, when I entered uh, the room it was like wow. Uh, I, I was actually shocked to be honest because the last time I interacted with uh, uh, a CFA uh, society group was uh, in 2011, I think, when I was serving SCCP. And uh, the, the, the group was much smaller at that time. It has grown. Um, and uh, when I entered, I was thinking about, there were two thoughts which crossed my mind. Firstly, uh, a lot of people say that uh, uh, the analysts, the quality of people, uh, has changed since 1990s when we were in the brokerage industry. I think that's the wrong impression. Today, we have such distinguished people, such great minds, and today this society, uh, this group of analysts has grown so much that uh, I think it has gone way ahead of what we used to have in our days in 1990s. So, uh, so congrats to the CFS Society for serving this country, for serving this community and for making us all proud, actually. And the second thought which I had in mind was that we talk about the brain drain from Pakistan, and I'm sure there is a lot of brain drain, obviously. Uh, in the last few decades, the rest of the world has offered a lot of opportunities to our people, and a lot of people have left. But despite the brain drain, we have such a large community of great minds, and that gives me hope. And uh, with these thoughts, I was thinking, that uh, what to talk about today. And uh, we, can, we, can, we can, I know there's a lot of uh, gloom and doom uh, in the ecosystem right now in the country. But uh, my job is to share with you what I am seeing uh, on the other side, what I'm seeing in the public sector. And uh, I, I do realize that sometimes 
being uh, positive, being an optimist, one gets a bit unreal. So I'll try not to be unreal. I'll try to be a realistic, optimistic person. And I'll try to share my thoughts of what I'm seeing, how this country's policy is shaping up, and what's happening in the corridors of power. And that's my job here today to share with you. So with these words, I think I'll talk about three things. Uh, first, the country. Second, the energy sector, which I'm responsible for today. And third, I would like to leave a message uh, to the people in Karachi, to this group of people in Karachi. Uh, so let's talk about Pakistan. Uh, what I'm seeing is, and, and this has been true over a large number of years, what I'm seeing is, 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 is tremendous potential going forward. Uh, we have a number of assets in this country. To begin with, uh, a great group of people, 220 million population. Uh, when I am talking to people who are coming from abroad and discussing the investment opportunities in Pakistan, despite the fact that uh, we have had issues on the LC front, on the dividend repatriation front, on the FX front, I have not met people who are not willing to invest in Pakistan. I have not. There are people who are saying we are still willing to invest in Pakistan, provided a couple of the issues that we are facing, they are resolved. And frankly, those are not very difficult to resolve. So I'm seeing that this is a country which offers huge potential and opportunities to investors. And that's one, one big opportunity that we have. Secondly, uh, we have huge potential in agriculture, uh, in mining, in IT, in exports. And one can ask that all of this potential was there before also. So what has changed? I think there's a big shift in how people are thinking in the country. And the shift is, I think, as a nation, uh, among the policy makers, we are going through a wake-up call. Sometimes things have to really get bad before they get better. And fortunately, they haven't gotten very bad in Pakistan. They are bad, but not that bad. Uh, they're challenging. And I'm seeing that there is a concerted effort among various stakeholders within the country who are trying to come together to fix things. I've been, in the, I've been in SACP, I was part of the power sector report, negotiation, and now the, the cabinet. And in, in the past, I always felt that the coherence which is needed to take decisions and to execute decisions, that was missing. The accountability was missing. Today, although it's a caretaker setup, but I believe and I think that this sort of momentum will continue no matter which government comes in power. What I'm seeing is there's a lot of coordinated effort in the country on the decision-making front. Various institutions and stakeholders are coming together, and they are holding people accountable. Like every morning when I go to the office, I know that I have to deliver. I know that there's so much I can talk on the media. And if I don't perform within a few weeks, I will be accountable. And this is not just true for me. It's true for every cabinet member. And this cabinet, this government, is working like the corporate sector. In the very first week when we joined, we were all asked to give our plan for the three or four months that we had, that we have. And then the PM office prepared a list of targets for everyone, which were shared with us. And now, on a two-weekly basis, we are all responsible to give an update on that. And we are asked uh, if we, have, if we are asked to meet the deadlines that we have. So the way the country is being run today, I don't think this is how the execution, the implementation, the decision making, and the coordination was happening. So that's a big change in the way the governance is happening in Pakistan. Now I know that at the, for, so far in the six weeks that we have been in power, we have been engaged in a lot of firefighting. But since the last week or so, I'm feeling that now we are able to breathe a bit. That firefighting mode is, is now finally tapering off. And we are now focused on some of the big tasks that we can achieve in the next few months. And now we're able to think and plan 
uh, we were able to step back, and that is what was needed, to come out of the firefighting mode, step back, think, and decide what to focus on. So overall, one message which I want to leave is, I feel that the country still has tremendous potential, and I'm seeing a big change in the country in terms of how decisions are being made, how accountability is being established, and I believe that this will continue in the next setup also. So that's one big message which I want to leave here. Uh, I know there are issues which are longer term. For example, the productivity of the country is low. It will take a while to fix that. I know our revenue collection and tax system is, is, is not up to the mark. It will take a while. But the first step towards revenue collection and taxes to, to get the right team in place. And there, there, there is an effort to do that. I know that industrialization will take time, but there, is, there are conversations around it. I mean, the, the, on a daily basis, when I look at the prices of energy, I know that I have to incentivize the industry. The, the model where the industry takes the burden and cross-subsidizes other categories uh, in, 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 in the country, this is unsustainable. Industry will create employment, industry will get as export dollars, and we, unless we give them energy at the right price, they won't be competitive globally and there'll be no exports. So this realization is there, but it will take a while to fix and, and really have that industrial development or reach a target of 50, 100, or 100 billion dollars. Some of the issues are short term, some are medium term, some are long term. So what I'm seeing is there are huge expectations and I'm sure that we will be able to achieve a bit, but I'm also sure that we will leave the foundation for the people who come in the future. And those foundations, those frameworks will hopefully won't be reversible, and they will have to continue on that path. That is the effort that we are trying to do. On the energy front, uh, let's talk about circular debt. I think that's an area of interest. Uh, circular debt, there are two parts. One is uh, every year the, the growth in circular debt and that's in the gas sector as well as the power sector. In the last few years, circular debt in the gas sector has grown much faster than the power sector. That will stop going forward. Uh, we have to and we are revising the gas prices. Uh, since, the last, uh, since I've taken over in the last seven weeks, that has been the top priority. It took a while because we had to be very careful in which category of consumers takes how much burden, how much cross-subsidization happens, how do we incentivize industry, how do we ensure that urea production is sufficient to meet the demand. So there were lots of, lots of considerations that we had to look at. But the circular debt flow in the gas sector will stop, inshallah, starting this year. As far as the power sector is concerned, that will take time. Uh, on the books, the power sector circular debt flow is zero because uh, it's all being paid off from the fiscal, but actually we're losing money in the power sector. That will take time because the losses and the lack of recovery is huge in the country. As I have already talked about it in the media, we lose 589 billion rupees in our losses and lack of recovery. Now that's a huge sum, that's half a trillion, more than half a trillion rupees. To fix that, one of the big things that we need is to take the discourse out of the government hands. And we are working on that, and I'll talk about it in a minute. But uh, the, the big problem on the circular debt front is the circular debt stock. In the power sector, we have 2.3 trillion do, uh, rupees of circular debt stock. And in the gas, the principal amount is 2.1, so that's 4.5 trillion. But 400 billion out of that is the, the transaction between the power and the gas sector, and 600 billion is the transaction within the gas sector. So I think we will clean that up. So we'll be left with around three and a half trillion of stock between the two sectors. Now that's a huge number. On three and a half trillion, the annual cost at the current interest rate is around 700 billion, which translates into the consumer prices, and which makes difficulties for the industry, electricity bills, as uh, uh, you were saying, uh, so, so how do we solve that? Now, frankly, there is no quick or easy solution to that, uh, but we are working on it. 
and uh, we have kept an internal deadline that by the end of October, early November, we should have some sort of a plan for circular debt stock. Uh, to be honest, we have ideas, uh, but they need to get translated into numbers and on the Excel sheets. Uh, but I'm quite confident that beginning November, we'll have some sort of a roadmap uh, on the circular debt stock. It may not be a roadmap which will fix it in the short term. It may be a roadmap which will fix it in the medium to long term, but we will have some sort of a roadmap because I don't think we can continue with this in the longer term. If the energy sector issues are not sorted, then, and if the energy sector faces challenges, then the banking sector, the financial sector will face equal challenges. So, so we are aware of that, we are cognizant of that, and we are working on that. Uh, we have we, we have made a few uh, big, we, we are making a few big shifts within the energy sector. Uh, on the policy front, we are revising a number of policies because what has happened in the past, the, the, the big issue has been the policy framework that we are living with. The big issue has been the pricing that we are living with. Uh, and those are the things that we are working on. I've already talked about it in the media, so I won't go into that. But I would want to talk about the opportunities which are existing, existent in the energy chain right now. Because taking advantage of this gathering of businessmen, bankers, and the capital market players sitting here, I would like to share some of those opportunities because that's where uh, Pakistan is going. I think within the petroleum sector, uh, there are huge opportunities which will come up in the future in the E&P sector. This has not uh, gotten enough attention in the past. Uh, there are very few players in this. Uh, there are some very large players, and the small to mid-sized players are very, very few. The, the policy framework that we are coming up with and the aggression with which we will be auctioning the blocks, I think ENP is, is, is going to be a huge opportunity going forward for the private sector to operate in. Secondly, I think going forward, whether, we, whether any government wants it or not, um, I think market forces will, will, will determine the pricing. It, it'll, our economy will become market-based. Government footprint will go down. Government's involvement will go down. Whether we want it or not, that's a reality which will happen. So when, when markets will rule, then a natural phenomena which will happen is privatization. Now, I know that the unbundling of the gas sector will take a while, but the power sector will see change of hands, and that will be soon. On the distribu distribution company's front, we have already decided that uh, because privatization will take a longer time, so we're giving long-term concessions. Globally, a number of utility companies and infrastructure projects are under long-term concessions, uh, 20, 30-year concessions in which the private sector comes in, they manage, and they, trans uh, they return it after 20 or 30 years, and they make their, their money based on the performance. So power sector discourse will be going into the private sector hands, and that will happen very fast. On the privatization front, uh, PIA will be the first one. Uh, work has already begun on that. Uh, the financial advisor will be appointed very soon. A steel mill again on the high priority list. So whichever companies are on the private privatization list, a lot of them will, will start going into the private sector and they'll start coming out of the government hands. I think that's, that's a big opportunity going forward for the private sector to look at. Uh, Pakistan has been working on creating competitive markets uh, in the power sector. We haven't seen much success on that, but I think in the next three or four months, we'll see some traction on that, and hopefully the bulk consumers will start engaging in the bilateral trading. We are working on that. So overall, the energy chain, there will be opportunities. Uh, there will be change of hands. There will be reduction in the government footprint. And uh, going forward, markets will dominate the pricing and the management of, the, of this sector. I was thinking that if I stand here today and talk about a lot of hope, 
then a natural question will be that why haven't we succeeded in in uh, capitalizing uh, in 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 uh, in uh, in benefiting from the prospects that the country has. And there are a number of reasons for that. I know that every, all of us will have different reasons for that. But I want to share one big reason, and I think that's a reason in which Karachi and this community can play a huge role. I think we have not really flourished, prospered, because of, uh, primarily because of our policy issues the policy framework, and why have we faced those policy issues? I believe that we have not succeeded in transporting or communicating the right ideas from the people who know what to do to the people who decide what to do. And I think there is a disconnect over there in the country. This group of people, Karachi, Lahore, Faisalabad, Multan, these are the business areas in the country, and Karachi being the leader in that. And this group of people who are analysts, who are thinkers, who play with data, and who analyze the entire economy, here are the brains sitting. Here are the ideas, what to do. Now, what is happening in the real world in Pakistan is, in Islamabad, the decisions take place. And how does that decision-making take place? That decision-making takes place in a way where people decide on the basis of selective information which they get from a select bunch of people who are communicating in Islamabad. The decisions are taken by people who are not economists, who are not businessmen, who are not industrialists, who are not bankers. So they are none of these. And the problem we are facing is on the economic front, on the financial front, on the business front. So there is a disconnect between people who actually know what to do and people who are deciding. And the disconnect has to finish. Now, how does that happen? We have a number of bodies who communicate their messages. We have business councils, we have chambers, but those have a certain, uh, a certain objective which they want to look after. I think what is missing in, missing in Pakistan is is a private sector independent policy research framework, policy research, research organization. There are organizations in Islamabad who are working on policy, who give ideas to the government, and I've been there for seven weeks. A lot of think, think tanks and research institutes have come to me and given ideas. But I think in Karachi, we need a research-based institute, we need a policy research institute, we need a think tank, which can be, which is independent and which has no vested interest, which serves no vested interest and gives independent thinking to the decision makers in, in Islamabad. And it can create the narrative building and can communicate those ideas. We talk about increasing the pie. We talk about not following the extractive model. But actually we have been following the extractive model because the groups who can access Islamabad they go and they impact the policy. And that policy translates into profitability for some sectors and other sectors suffer. But it cannot go on forever. So if we want to increase the pie, and when the pie increases, the biggest beneficiaries will be the people sitting in this room. When Pakistan's GDP increases from $1,500 to $3,000 and people have more purchasing power to buy products and services, people sitting in this room will be selling those products to them. The industrialists will be expanding their industries. The bankers will be getting more money in the banking system. So the eventual beneficiaries are sitting here. So the idea I want to leave, and I don't know whether it will happen or not, but I hope it happens, that some people, someone in Karachi, needs to create this organization or these organizations which are thinking, coming up with ideas, and communicating those ideas to Islamabad to improve the policy making of this country. I mean, we talk about the West and US and Far East, but then they came up with Brookings and Rand and Aspens long time ago. I mean, CFS Society, uh, 20 years ago, 
I remember when, well, not even 20 actually, 30 years ago, when we used to, I used to be in brokerage, we were aspiring to get the awards from Asia money and Euro money. And today, is CFA society. So this society has created an impact. So we need, an ins we need think tanks or research institutes like that, like this, who can create that impact and communicate the right ideas to decision makers. Uh, with these words, thank you again for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be here among all of you. And in the end, bahut bahut mubarak to all the people who are getting awards today. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a big round of applause for our distinguished chief guest. May I also now take this opportunity to...